Hey everyone, I'm Will and in this video we're going to critique some of my early photography so you can learn from some of the common mistakes I made when I first picked up a camera. Alright, first mistake, getting down too low. You can see here that a lot of my early photographs I was basically jumping in and more or less getting right down to the ground level. Now, to this very day I still shoot quite low at times because obviously you can get a unique perspective and emphasize some foreground details but one of the problems and you can see it here perfectly in this image is we have the pier running along and then as it hits the horizon we have no separation now from basically foreground to midground our foreground is basically running straight in and where the midground would be where we could have a nice layer of lake instead we just have the pier hitting the background so we we're losing that separation and that's one of the things that will happen when you get down too low we can see it here again we're basically just showing water then more or less meeting the sky if i stood up in this image then we would have had a layer of water along the top which could have led nicely into that background and even here, if you look in where those boats are in the harbour, they're breaking the horizon and covering up the lighthouse, all those other details in the background. So if I was slightly higher here, we could have led in to the water, then had the boats, then had a gap behind the boats of more water, then into the lighthouse. So essentially getting down too low, keep an eye on is your foreground going to come in and then blend in with the background because that's what you want to avoid so keep the key word really would be separation are you separating your zones the foreground the big ground and the background all right the next thing to keep an eye on is your main subject matter and not having it too close to the edges so i've got two of the uh two of these examples here both lighthouse images and look how far I've put it to the extreme edge of the frame on both examples. What this does is obviously the eye goes straight to the main subject, but because we've thrown it so close to the edge, you basically have the other, you know, in this case, 90% of the frame screaming for attention because I've given it so much real estate. But there's nothing going on there so the eye gets drawn back to the subject but then we have that it's a, basically a balance issue it's not balanced correctly you've got all this portion with all the real estate with nothing happening and then the main subject matter on the extreme edge so the brain is just conflicted and going back and forward it's just incredibly displeasing to look at and it's happening on both examples now Obviously my theory back then was I was obviously obsessed with the colour in the sky and I was trying to fit as much of that in as possible. But you could have still achieved the same result just by changing the composition, bringing that lighthouse in closer to the centre. I'm not saying it has to be dead centre, but somewhere around that centralised area. And that is often what I'm trying to do in my work. I want the eye to finish in the centralised zone. That way it's balanced and the viewer's attention isn't falling off. So with your framing, keep an eye on where you're placing subjects of importance and make sure that it's not too close to the edge. So edge control. Here's a great one, uh, white balance. Now back then, I don't think I was shooting raw files, I was shooting JPEG. So there was very little opportunity to adjust the white balance later in post. So really what I was shooting was what I was stuck with. So whether you do it in the field or do it later in post-processing, I basically shoot in auto white balance and because I'm shooting raw, I have the ability to adjust that later on in post, which I pretty much recommend you do as well. But I just, I don't think I really had an eye for how bad these colors were. Um, it's just incredibly overboard, oversaturated as well. But really it's a white balance issue first and foremost. The camera has just overdone it. So maybe I had it on the incandescent or something that's really given it a cool tone, but not good, just completely unrealistic. So just keep an eye on your colors. Now, obviously we can have amazing sunrises and sunsets with great colors, but this type of extreme hues just doesn't really naturally occur in nature. Lots of blues in this one as well, real deep blues, high contrast. So keep an eye on your white balance, shoot raw, and then you can tweak that later. So don't worry too much about in-camera if you're shooting raw. Like I said, I generally just leave it on auto. 
and then we can adjust that in post. But it is common to potentially get too much magenta in an image, particularly if you're photographing sunrises and sunsets. So keep an eye on those sliders, your temperature and tint sliders in either, you know, Photoshop or Lightroom, etc. These might be some of my favorite ones to look back on. The basically ultra high dynamic range, which has occurred from taking multiple exposures and then allowing software to uh, blend the images for me, which you end up getting a look that is incredibly unrealistic because one of the things that's happening is there's no shadows and no highlights. So we end up with one large mid-tone. This tree image is a great example because we have the sun there, which as you know, if you try to look at the sun, it's just not possible. It's a bright highlight. But in this image, the auto um, editing that I've used here, the software, I think it was called Photomatics actually, but it's, it's used like a gray tone in the highlight now. So it has a weird burnt look. And then realistically that tree should have some shadows in it because it has the sun right behind it. So it is being backlit. There should be some darker tones in there, but there's just none. So, you know, maybe it was three, maybe five images that I was shooting with the bracketing mode, chucking it in this software and then just pushing a button. And you can do this in Lightroom, Photoshop. There's probably a million ways to do this now. These days, thankfully, we have dynamic range big enough on our cameras that you can more or less shoot a scene like this with one exposure and then just bring up enough shadow details in the tree to keep it realistic. And at the end of the day, a highlight if you're looking, if you have the sun in the frame, it should remain pretty much a highlight, relatively bright. Now you want to control it as much as you can, but it's okay to have a bit of a highlight in there, some white, but you just want to keep an eye on how much there is. So really the tip here is auto software for blending. You're really not going to get the best result because how the software doesn't know what nature really looks like. In reality, we have shadows, we have highlights, we have midtones. This software often tries to give you a result that's going to be really balanced and, and just quite a flat uh, scene with no no realistic dynamic range. So keep an eye on auto blending. Obviously, there's probably ways to do it now more accurately in an automatic way and tweak it, but I still prefer to do this manually. Um, and it's okay to have that darker shadows and brighter highlights. Okay, let's talk about negative space. Negative space is a portion of the image where there's no real subject matter. Negative space is okay and it's effective in leading the eye, but if you have too much negative space, it basically becomes a distraction and an area where the eye is going to flow to and then you essentially being let down, the viewers being let down. I've got these examples here. A lot of them are low perspectives, which we've spoken about already. But I'm showing off so much sky and there's just nothing happening there. All the action is in the lower portion of the image. So for some reason, I've given this sky so much real estate for no reason. One of the main ways I'll combat this is by tilting down slightly, particularly with a wide angle lens. I won't put the horizon dead center, which I have done here in some of these older images. Instead of putting the horizon in the middle, I'll tilt down slightly. So therefore I might have something like a, a 40, 60 split. So maybe 40% sky and then 60% lower portion. The reason for that is one, you're going to remove some of that negative, negative space up there, but also intuitively then the eye will be drawn to that lower part of the frame because you've given it just a little bit more real estate. Maybe it's a 70-30 ratio that you're going to go with. Um, I find this effective in, in leading the eye, telling people to begin in the foreground and then flow into the background. So by showing so much negative space here and giving it a 50-50 split, the eye is just drawn to the sky as much as it is the lower part, but really the lower part is the subject matter. So if I wanna draw the eye there, I should tilt down, get the horizon up slightly. So keep an eye on negative space where is it in the image? Maybe it's just in the corner somewhere. Are there ways with your composition if you move around slightly to fill in that space so the eye doesn't just drift off into a pocket uh, where you don't necessarily want it to go? So just take that time to analyze your frame or your edges and then adjust your composition accordingly to remove those negative spaces. Overexposing highlights. Back when I first started, and which is perfectly normal, and I'm sure it'd be the same for you if you're just starting out, you're gonna be probably in auto mode. Now the auto modes, and it can be in the semi-autos as well, maybe it's aperture priority, etc. but you're not always going to be getting, when your camera is metering the light that's in front of it, 
it's going to take an average typically and try and take an image that's balancing out the exposure. Now, one of the things that will typically happen with landscape photography is your camera will meter the darker areas and get an exposure for that and then it will completely blow out the sky and you're losing all the detail up there. One of the best ways to combat this is to learn about the histogram and understand about exposure, the exposure triangle. One of the most common ways to shoot with modern cameras is to expose for our highlights. So make sure that you're not losing those highlight details. And then in the processing, we pull up the shadow details. The shadow recovery on modern cameras is really good. Another real simple way to avoid this problem is to not shoot the sun when it is so big and bright and harsh in the sky, because in reality, it's a flaming ball of fire. You can't look at it with a human eye, so you're not gonna be able to take a photo of it and retain any detail, because there are no details there. So either put the bright sun out of frame, or wait till it gets a little bit lower, very close to the horizon, and then you should be able to retain those details there. If the sun's not in the frame at all, like we have in some of these images, then this, the clouds were still blowing out, and I didn't realize, so perhaps, just shooting a little bit better for the histogram. So retaining those highlights in the field would be the main tip. Otherwise, back in post-processing, you might be able to recover some of those highlights as well, potentially just using the highlight slider or using in a local adjustment wherever those highlights are. But keep an eye on that. It's something that I just didn't even realize was occurring until I think someone just pointed out to me, um, you know, what was happening and then once i realized i couldn't unsee it but there was a lot of those early images that i took where there was huge overexposed portions next tip is about subject matter and actually having a clearly defined subject that is actually interesting a lot of my first photographs i would just basically go down to the beach and i was happy just photographing the water swelling over the rocks now that's good practice when you're first learning but essentially you're taking images of scenes where when you share it with someone, they don't really know what you're trying to share with them. What do you, what's the story trying to tell? What are we photographing here? So you look at some of these early works and I've somewhat ticked the boxes on, you know, things that could be interesting, whether it be slow shutter water, which looks nice, a sunrise, um, some interesting rocks. Some of the elements are there, but at the end of the day, it's just not really a very good subject matter in itself because it's not clearly defined. So it's either going to be a composition issue. Maybe you have the right subject, but you're not composing it properly. So you're not making it very clear what that subject matter is. Or at the end of the day, you need to actually say to yourself, is this really an interesting subject here? Some slimy rocks with, <laughs> with water rushing over them. Um, you know, it is fun when you're playing around with slow shutters and you're getting that result, but it, you need to say, okay, where is the subject? How can I make this an interesting photo? I need to have something interesting in the frame to begin with. And I'm not saying you can't just point down at rocks on the ground and take a good photo, because you certainly can, but you need a very good eye to do that. So when you're first starting out, give yourself some nice, easy subjects. A nice big tree, the lighthouse, which is what I used a lot a mountain, the, the jetty on the lake, whatever it is, something nice and easy and defined. Because if you're just gonna start throwing in all these various elements and not composing it properly, it's gonna be very hard for the eye to cohesively flow through that image. Halos, you've probably heard about this before. A lot of my original images were automatically edited using software. So basically I just threw in a series of raw files or even JPEGs bracketing and then letting the software edit for me. And what would happen is I'd get a halo around the edge of some of my subject matters. This can still happen today if you're going a bit heavy on the clarity slider in Photoshop or Lightroom, or just not paying attention to your processing and being heavy handed, you get a real glow around lo uh, lines and your subject. And this can even happen if you're using local adjustments in Lightroom or Photoshop. If you're not paying attention, say on an adjustment brush and the brush is a little bit too big, you start going outside the lines with brightening and you get this un basically a halo around the subject matter. It's something that you just probably won't really see at first when it's your photo. You're so, you're so zoned in on you know other areas and it's not until you kind of step back and if someone points it out. So hopefully once you get the eye for halos, um, you'll start to see it more often, but I definitely had my fair share in some of these early images.
Incorrect shutter speed. Now it's all subjective. You can pick whatever shutter speed you like, but when it comes to moving water, particularly on a beach or maybe it's a river or something, ask yourself, what is going to help lead the eye through the image? And often that will be a shutter speed that's not too slow. When we go too long on the exposure, as you would know, water just completely smooths out. It starts to go steamy. And by that stage, it, it, you've lost all your texture in there. So a lot of my early images, I was shooting them in such low light in probably AV mode or something. So it was, the camera was most likely selecting shutter speeds that were two, three, four seconds and longer. And by that stage, all the water just turned into mist and milk and lost all its beautiful details. So you can see, you know, let's say a seascape, for example, that it's beautiful to get that texture in the ocean, show some waves crashing. You can certainly keep it at a slow shutter speed, but keep it at a semi-slow shutter speed. So have a play with shutter speed out in the field. Don't just go for the long stuff because it all starts to look the same after a while. We lose texture and you're just missing out on the opportunity to create some nice subtle details throughout the image. All right, everyone, I hope some of those tips might help you on your own photography journey. There's a few more on my channel if you want to check out the other videos and also check out the description below for a sale on my photography masterclass. Cheers.